Stress is the disease of the century. It's a multi-billion dollar business. But Jesus said, I came that you might have peace. My peace I give unto you. So you have peace. If you are a Christian, you have peace in you. If you have received Christ as your Savior, you have received the Prince of Peace. He lives in you. Peace is in you. But I gave an example last night of how if there's a storm, the top layer of a body of water will be wavy and ripply and bouncy and not, not smooth and calm, but way down deep, that water is still just as calm as it can be. And if we look at ourselves like that, there's always something blowing on the surface of our lives. But peace is defined as a quiet heart. And so no matter what's going on in our circumstances, we can maintain a quiet heart. Now, I'm just going to say that I believe that's easier for some people than other people. Um, I'd like to say that's not fair, but however, God creates us all differently and we all have to learn how to, there's something that's hard for everybody. So like my husband, it's very easy for him to cast his care and not to worry about things. And so he's been a perfect picture of peace throughout our 48 and a half years of marriage. I, on the other hand, was just, you know, hanging by my fingernails about everything, you know, all the time. Uh, so that has not been as easy for me, but I've learned how to be peaceful. And I can tell you that I'm probably more peaceful now than I've ever been in my whole life. And I have more responsibility than I've ever had in my whole life. And so if I can learn to be peaceful, you can learn to be peaceful. I said, if I can learn to be peaceful, you can learn to be peaceful. Now, I believe that whatever the word is preached on, there's power to bring deliverance to people in that area because there's power in the word. So I'm expecting bondages to be broken off of people in this area. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it, just magically all your stress is going to go away, but something is going to happen in you. Something's going to be broken and you're going to receive a revelation that you don't have to live that way anymore. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden and overburdened, and I will cause you to rest. I will ease, relieve, and refresh your souls. Sounds to me like he's saying, I can teach you how to live without stress. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now, these two scriptures prove out what I'm trying to say. If we just read verse 28, it looks like all we need to do is come to Jesus and he's going to make all this happen. Say, come to me. If you're laboring, heavy laden, overburdened, I'll cause you to rest. Well, we, we would just like to take that part and go, <laughs> Jesus, here I am, do it. But then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So learn of me means, okay, I can show you how to have ease and relief and refreshment and recreation, but you're going to have to watch how I live and you're going to have to follow me and learn to do things the way that I do them. Now, he uses this term yoke, take my yoke upon you, which we are probably not as familiar with. So I actually have a, a picture that we're going to put up that we want to show you of what it means to be yoked with someone else. Now, that is called a yoke of oxen. And you see that they are connected together because if the two are pulling the load, it makes the load a lot simpler. And Jesus is literally saying to us, if you will stay yoked to me, attached to me, I will pull with you through life and it will make your load a lot easier. But now we want to understand that Jesus is saying, there's another analogy to this, and I believe it's stay so close to me, stay connected to me, stay with me in every situation and watch closely and see how I would do something and then you follow me and in that way, you will not be living under stress all the time. Okay, you can take that away. I wanted you to see what that was. A good prayer, a wonderful prayer is, oh God, teach me your ways. 
The Bible says that the Israelites saw the acts of God, but God taught Moses his ways. See, the Israelites wanted miracles. Many people want miracles. Oh, God, make this go away. God, change this situation so there's no pressure on my life. But Moses went deeper, and I'm asking you to go deeper and say, God, whatever the circumstances do, let them do it. But you teach me your ways. You teach me how to handle it the way you would handle it. Come on, can we come up a little higher? I said last night, I spent a large part of my life trying to change the people around me. If I didn't like what Dave did, I tried to change Dave. And, you know, you love all your kids, but you don't always like all their personalities. And so I had kids that I loved, but I frankly wasn't too crazy about their personalities. The one that I had the most trouble with was just like me. And so that was, that's always a nightmare waiting to happen. And, um, so I was trying, trying to change them, trying to change Dave, trying to change my kids, trying to make my ministry grow, and trying, 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 trying. And uh, it just wasn't working. It wasn't working at all. And God didn't want to change everything around me. And I don't want to upset you when I say this, but somebody needs to tell you, God doesn't want to change everything around you. He wants to change you. I see, I just feel drawn over here. Boy, if we can just get that through our head. God doesn't want to change. So all my circumstances just suit me all the time. And life is cushy and good. He wants to change me. Jesus said, follow me. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't mean follow me around and let me make your life amazing. He meant watch me and learn how to do what I do. Now, before I go any further with this wonderful message, God inserted something in it this morning that I believe is just like a, a word from God for some people here today. And God dropped this in my heart when I was sitting up here this morning doing worship. I thought at first I was just going to do an exhortation, but then I realized I needed to add it to my teaching. Uh, we're going to look at Psalm 32 for a minute, the first five verses. And I want to talk to you for a minute about guilt and condemnation. Wasn't part of my message, but I feel like God wants me to talk to you about guilt and condemnation because I believe that there are people here today that you're just like I used to be. You literally feel guilty pretty much almost all the time. And uh, matter of fact, you don't feel right if you don't feel wrong. That's the way I was. I grew up feeling guilty because my father was abusing me. And um, I just took it on with me into life. And so I always felt guilty. Even after I confessed my sins, I still felt guilty. And there's nothing more stressful. And I want you to listen to me. There is nothing more stressful <laughs> than going around with that burden of something's wrong with me. Why can't I do things right? This vague feeling that God's mad at you, that he's not satisfied with you. And I believe that no matter what else I teach you, this is what I felt like I saw this morning, no matter what else I teach you about how to manage stress, if you don't get this point first, then everything else in life will just do you in. Because when we're already feeling so beat down and so bad about ourselves, because we can't do everything just right, then anything else that comes along just puts us over the edge. God gave me an example one time of a pressure cooker, and I don't know, I don't know that people used them as much as they did when I was growing up, but my mother had a pressure cooker, and I'll tell you what, that was a fierce pot. Because when she puts stuff in that, you put this lid on and you seal it and you can't get it off. And it's got this little jiggle thing on top and steam shoots out of the top every once in a while. And it, it, the more the stuff cooks inside, the faster the thing moves. And it, it's just like, I remember my mother saying all the time, don't touch it, don't touch it, don't touch it. And um, I used to be like that pressure cooker. I would have all this stuff going on inside me. 
And no matter how spiritual I looked or how many times a week I went to church or I still had all this stuff going on inside me. What's wrong with me? Why can't I do everything right? Anybody, does anybody know what I'm talking about? You're looking too innocent for me. And um, so I was always exploding. I always say I got along with everybody until somebody came home and then it was... <laughs> I don't even know what I talk about. I mean, I got. I mean, I could just explode over the simplest little things because I just felt so stressed out all the time. <laughs> and I thought it was my circumstances, but honestly, a large majority of it was what was going on in me. So then, if anybody would just touch me in any way that any circumstance would touch me, I would explode. Well, I was like that pressure cooker. And so I just want to tell you that this has to change before we go any further. And I don't want you to leave here today and go keep repeating the same thing over and over and over. Look at me and let me tell you something. You are an imperfect human being and so am I. And that is exactly why Jesus came for us. And there is not one of us here that's ever going to do everything right. Not even one day. Not even one day. We've all sinned our way right to the meeting this morning. We were sinning on our way. I mean, if you, you know, the Bible talks about sinning in thought, word, and deed. Well, I can't say that all my thoughts have been beautiful so far today. But thank God I know how to cast them down now. All right, Psalm 32. I just, this is for somebody, somebody, bunch of somebody, somebody watching TV. Let's get this. Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied is he who has forgiveness of his transgressions continually exercised upon him whose sin is covered. Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied is the man to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, before I confessed, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand of displeasure was heavy upon me. My moisture was turned into the drought of summer. Selah, pause and calmly think about that. Are you ready for this? Verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord continually unfolding the past until all is told. Then you instantly forgave me the guilt and the iniquity of my sin. Pause and calmly think about that. You instantly forgave me, not just the sin, don't miss it, the guilt. The guilt. Let me ask you a question. If God's removed our sin, what is there to still feel guilty about? You do not have to live under condemnation. I don't know. I think sometimes we think it's religious to hate ourselves. Well, I'm just a no good. No, listen, you, you need to put on the robe of righteousness and lift your head up and know that you're the head and not the tail. God loves you. You're above and not beneath. You're anointed by God. Amen. You've got what somebody else in this world needs. You're not ever going to get rid of the burdens of stress in your life if you don't start by having a right attitude toward yourself inside. So if you don't like yourself, then you best come to terms with it because everywhere you go the rest of your life, there you are. <laughs> and if you can't get along with you, everything else is going to be rough. Amen. Did somebody need that? I hope somebody needed that now. So when Jesus said, come to me and learn of me, one of the first things that Jesus teaches us is to receive his forgiveness and to not live under condemnation. Now, four things that Jesus did to manage stress. You say, Jesus had stress. Well, we talked about that last night. I mean, for goodness sakes, everywhere he went, somebody was trying to kill him. I mean, we don't have to go over that list again, do we? <laughs> Judas betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Peter denied him. 
Talk about a bad day. We haven't had a bad day. Number one, he trusted himself and everything to God. First Peter 2, 23. Now, some of you are all stressed out over some stuff that you cannot do one thing about and only God can. And you need to give it to God. You need to leave it and let it go and give it to God. And that includes your past, your future, your kids, and everything else that you're all upset about. First Peter 2, 23, I love this. When he was reviled and insulted, he did not revile or offer insult in return. When he was abused and suffered, he made no threats of vengeance, but he trusted himself and everything to him who judges fairly. I love that scripture. I've actually got it on my office wall. Reminder to me, just trust God with everything. Little things, big things. And especially trust him with what happens to me. What I get, God, is up to you. If I don't get it, you've got a reason. If somebody mistreats me, then I'm not going to waste my life hating them. I'm going to trust you to take care of it. You have to learn to trust God with every little thing because actually trust is the answer to all frustration. Second thing that Jesus did was he prayed. You know, he was always kind of wandering away from the crowd and praying. He got up early to pray. Sometimes he prayed all night. And I'm not going to take the time to turn to these scriptures, but when he was in Gethsemane, preparing for what was going to be the most difficult time of his life and anybody else's, he asked his disciples to, to pray with him. And we know from reading the Gospels that they fell asleep. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to show grief and distress. And then he said to them, this is how he felt. You know, we don't have to do everything we feel. He said, my soul is very sad and deeply grieved so that I'm almost dying of sorrow. Now stay here and keep awake and watch with me. And he went away for a little bit. When he came back, they were asleep. But one of the things that happened that enabled him to go through this was while he slipped away from them, an angel came and ministered to him, strengthening him in spirit. And one of the things that happens when we pray is God strengthens us. Come on now. He enables us. He doesn't, prayer doesn't always mean that God gets rid of what's bothering us. Many times he chooses to strengthen us and enable us to endure it with a good attitude. And it took me a long time to get okay with that because I didn't want to have to endure it. I wanted God to get rid of it. Amen. And the third thing that Jesus knew how to do to help him with the whole stress factor, he knew when to be quiet. <laughs> uh oh. John chapter 14, verse 30. Jesus said, I will not talk with you much more for the prince, the evil genius, the ruler of the world is coming and he has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There's nothing in me that belongs to him. He has no power over me. Now, you know, I've taught on this scripture a lot and it still just amazes me. The Bible says over in Isaiah 53 that like a sheep led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. And I wonder how many times we've read that and don't have any foggy clue at all why the Bible would say that. Do you know how hard it is to keep your mouth shut <laughs> when you're under pressure? <laughs> and we need to learn from this. Come on, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So we're looking at how Jesus handled the most intense stressful time of his life and the Bible says he opened not his mouth and he told his disciples he purposed I'm not going to talk with you much right now he might as well have said because this is a very difficult time for me the enemy has no hold on me and I'm not going to open my mouth and say something I shouldn't say and give him an entrance into my life how many of you are glad that Jesus kept his mouth shut on that day I, you know, I find this very interesting. And then in Matthew chapter 27, 
verses 12 through 14. It says, but when the charges were made against him by the chief priests and the elders, he made no answer. <laughs> then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many and how serious are the things that they're testifying against you? And he made no reply. <laughs> Boy, it's so hard not to try to convince people that you're a good person. I don't know about you, but I find that hard not to defend myself. But you just don't understand me. You don't understand. You got the wrong idea about me. Be still and let me convince you that I'm a good person. Jesus made no reply. <laughs> but he made no reply. And again, before Pilate and Herod, he remained silent <laughs> while being accused. I'm not saying that there's never a time to speak up for yourself, but a lot of times it just makes matters worse. Jesus was on the cross. This is amazing to me. Jesus was on the cross for five hours and 59 minutes. During that time, the record of what he spoke was a total of 41 words in Greek that turned into 51 words in English. Speaking these words took approximately a total of one minute. So for five hours and 58 minutes of his time on the cross, he was completely silent. <laughs> Amen. And then the fourth thing that Jesus did, which is a great stress reliever, is he quickly forgave. <laughs> okay, let me, can I just give you a hint? If you want to have a stressed out, miserable life, just go ahead and be easily offended. Just go ahead and keep saying, well, you know, I can't help it. I'm just touchy. I just, I'm just a touchy person. I just get my feelings hurt easy. Well, stop it. <laughs> Anybody can just get their feelings hurt easy if they want to. On the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. On the cross. And surely if he could forgive people for that, we can get over some of the day-to-day -day things that come our way. I'm just telling you. I don't know what you expected me to tell you when I told you I was going to teach on how to get rid of stress, but I mean, it's not going to do one bit of good. You could relieve every stressor, everything that you think is causing your stress. And if you stay full of guilt and you stay mad at people and you keep worrying about what everybody thinks and you got your mouth going all the time, you're still going to be stressed out. Because real stress is not from what's going on around us, it's what's going on in us. Amen? Well, you should be happier than what you are, but I'll go on. Acts chapter 24, 16, I want you to look at this. I think this is a great scripture. The apostle Paul said that, he said, therefore, I always exercise and discipline myself mortifying my body, deadening my carnal affections, bodily appetites, and worldly desires, endeavoring in all respects to have a clear, unshaken, blameless conscience, void of offense toward God and toward man. I love that. Paul said, look, I worked at this. This is not something that just falls on you. This is something you're going to have to get up and do on purpose every day. Every day I'm going to have to say no to my flesh. Every day I'm going to need to discipline myself. You know what? I think we should all just have a goal. Let, let's all agree together to have a goal. Let's join together and see if we can't give Satan a nervous breakdown. And, and every time these stressors come our way, we're going to say, nope, 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 nope. Been there, done that. I'm not doing it again. Let me ask you a question. How many of you are too busy? You know what? I actually don't have to put my hand up now. And you know, the ministry is the biggest that it's ever been and growing all the time. And I work less. 
than I ever did because I'm working smarter, not harder. Yeah. Amen. We all know the story of Mary and Martha. Martha was working and Mary, I'm sure, was working too until Jesus showed up and then she immediately sat down at his feet because she had an opportunity she didn't want to miss. And I wonder how many of you are like I was where you are so addicted to work that you're missing the really important things in life. Like how many of you are so busy that your children are almost grown and you barely know them? You know, when you're old, if you don't have any relationship with your kids, you're not going to be happy. And a relationship just doesn't start all of a sudden because you're the parent. You have to build those relationships. And relationships take one thing, and that's time. Relationships aren't built on even what you do for your children or what you buy them. Relationships are built on time. Spending time with them. Are you married to somebody you barely know? <laughs> well, wonder where this could go. Do you find a place every day in your life to laugh? You should. Laughter is a great stress reliever. It's probably better than any anxiety medicine you could take. Are you lonely because you never took time to build any quality relationships? Do you wish you were closer to God, but you never took time to study his word or spend time with him? Do you feel sick and tired most of the time, but truthfully, you never take the time to sleep or exercise or rest or laugh or play well you know what that's not something that God's gonna make go away for you he's gonna give you wisdom and he's gonna give you grace and help you make the changes in your life that you need to make I told you last night that I literally almost fell apart physically I worked so hard I made myself sick at least three different times in my life and when you get to be that kind of sick, you don't get over it with a two-week vacation. It takes a long time sometimes to come back from that kind of stuff. And I'm happy to say that I feel better now probably than I ever have in my whole life. But it's not just because I prayed and God made it all go away. I had to really make some radical changes. And I told you last night, one of the first things that I did was I started really studying my own life and finding out what my peace stealers were. What were the things that Satan was using to steal my peace? And for example, one of them was rushing. I don't behave well. The fruit of the Spirit does not pop out of me when I am having to rush. They say that you never know what kind of fruit you got till you squeeze it. Well, let me tell you. There's nothing like the squeeze of rushing, 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 rushing. And so we don't have to do that. We can either cut some things out or we can make better preparations the night before. One of the things that I almost always do now, if I know that I'm going to have a shorter period of time in the morning, like if I have to leave earlier, I will always decide the night before what I'm going to wear and get it out and lay out the jewelry that goes with it and be ready so I don't have to get in my closet and try to figure out what to wear. Amen? And there's other things you can do too. Make your kids lunches the night before. Make your kids make their own lunches. There's a lot of stuff you can do. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 is a couple of really favorite scriptures of mine. Look carefully then how you walk. Take a careful look at your life. When you leave here, would you just take 15 to 30 minutes sometime this afternoon, get somewhere by yourself, and just think about your life? Would you take a little inventory of your life? 
Don't just come and sit there and just spectate at me and listen to what I have to say. Participate. <laughs> Go home and just do a little bit of inventory and think. Am I happy with my life? Do I believe that I'm doing with my life what God wants me to do? Am I living an unsustainable life? It's amazing how many people say, I know I can't keep this up forever. Well, how about now being the time that you decide to change? How about now being the time to realize that you need to make an investment in yourself? Now is the time to cut off a lot of those things in your life that aren't bearing any good fruit anyway. Look carefully how you walk. Live purposely and worthily and accurately, not as the unwise and the witless, but as wise, sensible, intelligent people. Making the most of your time, buying up each opportunity because the days are evil. As I said, my ministry is the largest it's ever been. We're broadcasting to two-thirds of the world in 83 different languages. Anyway, I won't get into all that, but just a lot of great opportunities. And I'm working smarter, not harder. I let a lot of people help me. And they don't always do everything the way I would like them to do it. But which is better? For me to let them relieve a lot of stress off of my life and occasionally me not like what they did? Or to keep insisting that I do it all myself so it's all done my way? I take regular breaks now. I don't just go from work to work to work to work to work to work. Because you know what I finally figured out? I don't care how hard I work, there's always going to be work. <laughs> Has anybody come to that point yet? I mean, no matter how hard I work, there's always going to be work. So I might as well just learn to not have to work all the time. Because God didn't do what he did for us in Christ. I want you to listen to me. God did not do what he's done for us in Christ and provide the life that he's given us so we do nothing but work all the time. Now, some of you probably need to work a little harder, but you know. There's always out of balance on either side. Five ways to de-stress. <laughs> Learn to practice shrug therapy. <laughs> We're all going to learn today how to do shrug therapy. My son bought me a new coffee pot, and uh, it pretty much does everything for you, except put the pot under where the coffee's coming out. It doesn't do that, and it doesn't put the filter. Now, there's a filter that you can just leave in there all the time, but I don't like that one, so if you're going to use paper filters, you got to put it in. But I mean, it grinds the coffee. It just it does everything. So I recently made a pot of coffee, but somehow or another, I didn't get the pot all the way under, and I left the room and went somewhere else, and it's a big pot. So needless to say, when I came back, I had this. And no, I didn't have time that morning to mess with it. <laughs> I looked at it. I can honestly tell you that I did not feel one thing. I just went. <laughs> that is shrug therapy. Amen? Now, I cleaned it up. I didn't like it. But I've wasted enough of my life getting in a full-on fit. Does anybody know what a full-on female fit is? All right. I mean, getting in a full-on fit over something that I couldn't do anything about. Don't try to control things that are out of your control. My daughter says a lot, it is what it is. And usually when she says it, she'll go like this. Hey, this is going to help you. Come on, let's practice. <laughs> you guys look cute. <laughs> oh, well. Dave does it a different way. He says, I'm not impressed. <laughs> he always says, if you're not impressed, you can't get oppressed. But 
See, even when he says that, there's a, a body language. I'm not impressed. It's shrug therapy. It's like, yeah, I'm not taking that on. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't care. But what it means is that you're casting your care. And guess what? God cannot and will not take care of us until we cast our care. Cast all of your care, all of your concerns upon me once and for all, for I care about you. The second thing that you can practice is staying in your comfort zone. Five ways to de-stress. Practice shrug therapy. Number two, stay in your comfort zone. Now that doesn't mean that we never do anything difficult. But it does mean that we recognize our limits and we respect them. In other words, stop trying to do stuff that you're lousy at. <laughs> Amen? You just don't know what a mess we would have if I went home and tried to make a piece of clothes or or bake some real fancy dessert, you know? I got this itch on me a couple of years ago and I thought, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some regular stuff. I get like that sometimes if I've just like done too many meetings or something in a row, you know, it's like, and see, even that, it's like, it's not even good for me to just be in a spiritual zone all the time. I need to be in a normal zone too. And, uh, so when I get like that, if I get really tired and I just overdosed on spirituality, then I, sometimes I want to get domestic, which is a joke because I'm not like, <laughs> that's just like not kind of like my thing. And uh, so I, I got cookbooks and I went out and I bought, you don't even want to know how much money I spent on spices. I mean, I got every kind of spice that you could possibly imagine. And my daughter's like, what are you going to do with that? I'm going to start cooking. It'll be good for me to cook. I'm going to enjoy this. It'll be good. So I decided I was going to make Dave and I a tuna casserole because we used to really like tuna casserole. And that's pretty easy. You know, like noodles, soup, tuna, cheese. It's not hard to make. And somehow or another, the thing turned out like glue. I mean, it was bad. Well, you know what? The spices are all still in the rack. And I've returned to my comfort zone and my strength. Because I can do this. I mean, I need a break from it. But this is where I'm comfortable. I'm not uncomfortable up here. You guys don't make me nervous. I mean, this is fine for me. But I would be stressed out if I was having to bake a cake and make Dave a pair of shorts or something. That would just be... <laughs> nightmare but stay in your comfort zone and don't think you have to compare yourself with somebody else my gosh that creates so much stress when we think we have to do what everybody else is doing and let me tell you something no matter what somebody else is doing if they like it they're gonna think the whole world should do it and if you don't stand up for yourself you're going to spend your life doing a bunch of stuff that you hate and despise and then feel bad because you're not good at it when it's not even what you're supposed to be doing. Amen? Number three, eliminate everything from your schedule that's not bearing good fruit. <laughs> That'll take another half an hour of time for you to spend with yourself. Eliminate everything from your schedule that's not bearing good fruit. Are you sitting on a committee that does nothing but argue and never makes a decision? Lord have mercy. I remember a church committee I was on one time. And they would argue and discuss what color to repaint the front door. Boring. How much time do you spend gossiping or listening to gossip? How much time do you spend listening to other people complain about their problems 
that they have no intention of doing anything about they don't want they don't want your help they don't want an answer if you gave them an answer they still wouldn't do it How much time do you spend watching really stupid stuff on TV? <laughs> or maybe just flipping through the channels for two hours and never watching anything. <laughs> now, you know, I know some of you probably really like reality TV, but I don't like it. I have enough of reality, thank you. <laughs> when I watch television, I want some fantasy. Give me a fairy tale. I want something like that is not connected to the earth. I don't want to sit and watch another family fight and almost kill each other. It took me 40 years to come out of that. Why do I want to do that? Number four. I'm just turn to the person next to you and tell them you're not going to like number four. <laughs> I, I'm just letting you know ahead of time you're not going to like this. Because the number four thing that you can do to relieve stress is to exercise. Exercise is one of the best stress relievers in the whole world. Now listen, we have these little things called endorphins in our body. And they're the feel-good hormones. And they are increased when we exercise. Endorphins make us feel happy and we worry less. Exercise improves your sleep, and that counteracts stress. If you exercise hard enough to sweat, it removes toxic poisons from your system. It can lower blood pressure, your resting heart rate, and cholesterol, and it improves your mood. I started working out at a gym almost 10 years ago. Now I work out at home. We've got a trainer and five of us work out at home. Two of our kids, Dave, me, one of my daughter-in-laws. And, and, uh, but I recently in the spring added walking. And so I now walk four miles every day in addition to the working out. Now listen. My cholesterol is the lowest that it's been in probably 15 years. And I, I'm just telling you the truth. And I'm not trying to push off on you what I do, but, well, yeah, I am. So I just, <laughs> I mean, truthfully, I am. You know? But honestly, I'm just going to tell you, just look at me and I'm going to tell you something. I cannot believe the energy that I have gotten from walking. I mean, it just shocks me the amount of energy that I have gotten from walking. And it's not easy. I'm doing hills and it's not easy to do, but I love it. And I'm just telling you, do what you want to with it. I'm your teacher, so I'm going to tell you what I believe 
is going to help you. And there is a lot of stress in the world today. And we've got more coming at us than any other time in history. Just all the little devices that we have to carry around with us. You know, we don't even want to go to the toilet without our phone. Come on, have any of you went back and got your phone and taken it to the toilet with you in case you missed a call? Well, I have too, so. And the world is not going to change. It's just ramping up for more and more and more. And one of the ways that you can really help yourself is regular exercise. So do what you want to with it. There it is. And number five, take time to relax and do things that you enjoy. Take time to do things you enjoy. Take little mini vacations, even if it's a 10 minute vacation. Take a little vacation. If you enjoy a cup of coffee in the afternoon, then take time to sit down, get away from everything, go somewhere where it's quiet, have a cup of coffee. If you enjoy getting a pedicure, then schedule where you can get one once a month. Just get away from everybody and go get one. Come on, you're worth 30 bucks or 35 or whatever it is to do that. <laughs> Look at things that are beautiful. Get out in nature and take the time to look at something pretty. Breathe and actually relax on purpose. Now, I just want to give you just a little bit of this, and I'm going to just take a couple more minutes, and I'm going to close. Today, we have a problem with choice overload. One of the things that creates so much stress is there's so many varieties of everything that nobody can make a decision. There are now in the grocery store 48,750 items. In an average grocery store, 48,750 items. There are 228 kinds of cold cereal, 67 kinds of oats and oatmeal products, 57 kinds of granola and muesli. There are currently 29 different kinds of M&Ms. And I saw this in an ad on TV the other night. A, a woman sent her husband out to get a can of beans. You've seen it? 17 kinds of this one brand of beans. Baked beans, baked beans with barbecue sauce, and baked beans with bacon, and baked beans with no bacon, and you know, just. I have more clothes than I've ever had in my life. How can I stand in my closet and not know what to wear? When I was a teenager, I had no problem. The closet was this big. There were eight outfits in it. Monday was yellow. Tuesday was blue. Wednesday was green. Thursday was something else. I didn't get confused over my shoes. I had two pairs.
I didn't have a hard time knowing what to watch on TV when we had three channels. But now that I have 500, I can't find anything to watch. <laughs> but listen, choice overload. You can relieve a lot of stress in your life if you will just start being decisive. <laughs> Some of you have got several decisions that you need to make and you are driving yourself crazy going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Well, what, what if I miss God? What if I miss God? What if I miss God? You know what? I'll tell you what he told me a long time ago. If you miss me, I'll find you. Come on, give God a praise. <laughs> 